Hi, my name is Tom Manning, and I'm here to talk to you about a multi-pronged attack on latent active and resistant strands of tuberculosis. Uh, we're working on a nanoparticle, specifically on its composition. Um, the nanoparticle is biodegradable. It should be inhaled. Um, we are making it small enough to be ingested by macrophages. Um, it's a multi-pronged attack on MTB, meaning that, for example, we have some nutrients in it that accelerate some metabolic processes within the bacteria, so for example, with latent TB to, to perhaps um, get it going some, so the drug uptake rate increases. There are different species that will provide bacterial cytal and bacteriostatic components. Um, and then there are also medicinal ingredients that will help it enter the circulation system um, outside, of the, outside of the lungs. Okay, so as I said, there's a number of components in this. The goal is to have a nanoparticle roughly 30 to 50 nanometers in size. Um, I'll start in the upper left hand corner, right, we include um, some amino acids, branched amino acids. We have cholesterol, we have copper stearate, we have vitamin C. The bulk composition is steric acid, which I'll talk about. We have a copper EDTA sucrose and or glucose complex. We include uh, the antibiotic, for example, with latent TB, we use um, isoniazid. Uh, we have PEG-3350, which is in there as a protector. Um, we have sodium acetate, which plays a couple of roles. Um, we have oleic acid, which is a fatty acid that actually has some toxicity against MTB. And then we use sodium chloride to help uh, regulate how fast our steric acid uh, or fatty acid component dissolves. Okay, so just kind of a quick review of what we just said. There's an antibiotic. There's other species that have bacteriostatic or bacterial cell activity. Um, there are some that provide an energy source for the bacteria to kind of get it going. Um, there are other parts that are part of the cell membrane, which means that if it has the drug enclosed in it, it's going to be pulled in for its use in building the cell membrane. And I'll bring the drug along with it. It's kind of a Trojan horse effect. There are species that uh, generate reactive oxidation species, um, like hydroxide um, or peroxide. There are some that bind proteins within the TB. Um, there are, the, by design, uh, when the material degrades, it makes micelles that are nonpolar and will stick to the predominantly mycolic acid uh, or nonpolar membrane, so it's a selectivity factor there. And then we also include some things to protect or prevent reactions from taking place until they're desired. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is steric acid. And by mass, that's somewhere between 55 and 75 percent of the mass of the composition. Steric acid is a solid, um, and it has a low solubility, which means that it will slowly dissolve. If we went to uh, fatty acids that were smaller, C10 or C12, they would be liquids. If we went to ones that are much bigger, they're, they're, the solubility goes down. They also become more expensive. Um, it is part of the cell membrane in mycobacterium. So when we form my cells with this, and there's a drug attached, or there's copper ions enclosed, et cetera, that these things sneak in as a part of a Trojan horse effect. Um, it's also a nutrient source for MTB, right? There have been some papers published on this. And so again, the MTB wants this inside, uh, at least in its membrane, if not into inside the membrane, and with it will take various drugs. Um, we, this, the aggregate uh, of composed of, uh, mostly steric acid should be viewed as cellular debris, and so the macrophage will uh, engulf it. Um, and then once it's inside the macrophage, the idea is that it's going to be digested, which will release all the things that we put inside it. Um, and th this low solubility in water can be adjusted by some other components that we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so one of the things we want to emphasize is that we think that as opposed to a tablet, um, or even an injection and an inhalation can be done where you have small particles, say anywhere from, the, from 20 to 50 nanometers in size, right? And these are much smaller than a macrophage, so they're easily ingested. We don't want these particles to be too big so that we deliver too much drugs and kill the macrophage. We like to keep them small so it's enough to knock out, for example, the latent TB that might be inside there. Also, I should point out that once they're in the lungs, that these will slowly dissolve and it will also put some of the drug into the bloodstream and circulate throughout the body. So it's not just a one-dimensional um, goal of hitting pulmonary TB, which is still roughly 90% of all TB, so it is a good place to start. Okay, so one of the things, and this is in no particular order, that we include is a copper complex. 
The problem with copper is if you put it directly in, it's going to react, right? It's going to bind to protein, it's going to react and produce oxidation and reduction, um, you know, ROS species. So we surround it with EDTA, right? Um, EDTA will entrap the copper ion, copper 2, and then it's also in a matrix with sucrose and or glucose. Sucrose is included because it's a non-reducing sugar, right? It has a low reactivity and can actually help wrap around that copper ion. Glucose is included as an energy source, again, to get some of the bacterial cellular processes going. So the uptake rate of the drug is um, accelerated. So when these tiny particles go in, which are, which are in part uh, ins inside the steric acid, um, they'll be digested because of the, the, the sugar sources, um, and then the copper ion will become free, right, and it'll wreak havoc, binding proteins, generating ROS species, right? Copper is well known to have a toxicity against TB. You just have to get it there without reacting. Um, as we mentioned, once copper is inside TB and the EDTA gets pulled off because it can react with other things that are in there, um, and the sugars are, are consumed as a nutrient source, copper can go in and it can bind proteins, you know, most proteins, and cause them to either function poorly or to stop functioning completely. Right? It also will generate reactive oxidation species. The common ones are things like hydroxide, you know, hydroxy radical, um, but it can also react with a whole bunch of organics. Okay, so we include PEG, which is you know fairly common as an excipient in pharmaceuticals, right? As an inert polymer, but we use it primarily. We'll talk about vitamin C in a minute, but we use PEG to help encapsulate vitamin C and the copper ions so that they don't react until we are ready for them to react. So it's really in there as a protector. I'll also point out that adding PEG, we, we, we pick 3350 as our size to go with. Much smaller in the solubility is, is, is very fast, much bigger in the solubility is fairly poor. But it also forms an ice aggregate, and we've had some copper isonized sucrose PEG compounds go through some preclinical trials and pharma, uh, PK testing, pharmacokinetics, and it actually works fairly well if we make it properly. Um, we also have sodium chloride crystals in there, okay? And sodium chloride is a strong electrolyte that will dissolve in water fairly quickly. And how much sodium chloride we add impacts how fast that steric acid nanoparticle dissolves, okay? Strong electrolyte, as it falls apart, goes into the water, it's going to leave gaps for water to slowly go in, and with time this will help it dissolve. Okay, oleic acid. And again, the, the percent you see up there is 5% would be an absolute max. We'd probably be down around 1 or 2 percent, 0.5 percent, something like that. So this is an unsaturated fatty acid, and what makes it a little bit different compared to some of uh, the other fatty acids is that it has a toxicity against different forms of mycobacterium. Um, and so the survival rate of 10 micromolar oleic acid in vitro is 0.04 percent, very low survival rate, at about a pH of 7, which is pretty close to the pH of human serum. This is a liquid at, under normal conditions, so we put it in the steric acid, right? It does get trapped at low concentrations. We can't go too high with it, otherwise it becomes, it goes from being a solid nanoparticle to just being kind of a little bit of a waxy mess. But uh, this is the one that has the highest toxicity against the mycobacterium. Um, the saturated uh, fatty acids have little to no um, efficacy against TB and the unsaturated ones, this is at least an order or two orders of magnitude better in terms of its ability to inhibit uh, the, the bacteria. Um, cholesterol is a normal excipient uh, ex that's put into, spell that slide, um, put into the mixture, but we had it for a different reason, right? So cholesterol, meco when mycobacterium tuberculosis infects cells such as macrophages, their survival is dependent on an accumulation of cholesterol. So cholesterol is a nutrient of sorts. It has to be there. MTB wants it inside. So this again is kind of a, a Trojan horse type effect is if we can activate that latent TB slightly by it uptaking the cholesterol, um, then there'll be other things that slip in with it. Okay, absorbic acid, vitamin C, it's well known, well I should say there have been several papers published where vitamin C by itself has toxicity against TB and vitamin C with antibiotics has improved toxicity against TB. So we put this in here, um, one of the things that we do is we wrap it in PEG, right, polyethylene glycol, 
because vitamin C can undergo oxidation or reduction and it can stick to some things, we want to protect it. Um, if you take vitamin C orally, right, there's an inefficiency in it reaching the uh, bacteria within the macrophages in the lungs, right? It, it, there's a tremendous loss. First is just distribution throughout the body. The second thing is that vitamin C is relatively reactive. So as it's going through the circulation system, right, it's gonna react with various things and then uh, not have any kind of medicinal activity at all. So by putting inside the steric, which is fairly inert and trapped in peg, and then it gets engulfed and then it's released, right, it, it, its toxicity um, or its ability to be toxic should go way up. Okay, sodium acetate. So sodium acetate does two things. Uh, one is we put in small amounts because the, the sodium acetate will react with steric acid in a weak acid base reaction and makes steric, and that will help regulate how fast or how slow the steric acid dissolves. Okay, um, and steric is a little bit easier to form micelles with than just the steric acid. Okay, or I should say the sodium, sodium steric. Also, acetate is naturally released by MTB, um, which means that if we add acetate, it sh and I should point out that acetate also has a toxicity for MTB, so, but it can expel it. But if we add additional acetate, we should flood that system, and that slight buildup of acetate will result in additional toxicity. By itself, it may not do anything, but it's kind of like someone having two or three or four infectious diseases at one time. It's gonna compromise the immune system of the TB. Um, there are three branched amino acids that are important for the survival of TB, particularly in, um, in macrophages, okay? So we can pull out a couple of papers related to this, but if we add this in low quantities where the total uh, concentration in our steric acid matrix might be one or two percent that what these are going to do is overwhelm a certain system and result in a, in a certain level of toxicity okay so it works with the three branched um, amino acids okay so zinc steric and copper steric okay so we already have this in steric acid we're going to make a little bit of steric when we react it with sodium acetate so these First, they serve to disrupt the steric acid matrix, so it's not just the smooth polymer type thing, and that's gonna help with the solubility. We can regulate solubility. Um, second, zinc is kind of a, an essential nutrient for TB, um, so there may be an uptake rate with that, accelerated, and again, the Trojan horse effect as we start accelerating some cellular processes, some drugs will go in. Copper sterate, obviously not the same as copper, right, because it's fairly well bound in there. Um, and when that slips into, when, when the TB uses the steric to help make its membrane, or it helps as an energy source, the copper is going to be right there to be reactive. Okay, so it's again a Trojan horse effect. Um, zinc is more of a nutrient, disrupts the membrane. With copper steric, we're using it for the copper because of its toxicity. Along with the EDTA, it's a way of kind of sneaking that ion in. Okay, so the next I'm gonna show quickly, just as examples, latent active or resistant TB. Um, the masses we use here are as ratio. So if I'm gonna make up a small formulation, right, steric acid melts at about 70 degrees C, we can add our things in, but we don't add them one at a time. So for example, vitamin C might be pre-made with some PEG, so it's encapsulated, that goes in. Um, the copper EDTA, sucrose glucose is made separately and then that goes in. So we make things separately to protect them so when they go in here then we can cool it quickly um, and then we can take it through a process to make it into nanoparticles. Okay, so for latent TB, and this is kind of, the, the isonized part is based on, um, the CDC has published uh, treatments for latent TB that are based just on isoniazid. So this might be the composition of a batch that gets ground up into nanoparticles and a fraction of that gets delivered uh, by inhalation. So 700 milligrams of steric, 300 milligrams of isoniazid, 50 milligrams of sodium chloride, right? Then there's the zinc and the copper sterate at 25 and 15 milligrams, right? Sodium acetate, 25 milligrams, cholesterol's in there at 50. Then we have our three branched amino acids right in at 10 then the oleic acid and the absorbic acid. Um, and again, those things are actually mixed in, like absorbic acid is with PEG, um, and then the copper EDTA would be with uh, PEG also. Right. 
So this would be for active, and this is a two part. So the left side is the first part. The second part is the second, as the, is the second part. You can see the first part is based on four antibiotics, and then we include some of the other things. And the second part is based on two antibiotics. And so if you look at the CDC treatment of this, right, what we've done is they have a two-step treatment um, for different periods of time, and it's that we'd make our nanoparticles up similar, but it includes the extra ingredients. Um, and so this one is uh, FDA recently approved a treatment for highly drug-resistant forms of TB, right? It's based on three different drugs. I think the one that's been in the news the most has been Bedopolin. Um, and then we add some of the additional components, um, and that would be our primary composition. On the left side is just given the, the it's a very heavy regimen of drugs, right? A lot of tablets, there's a terrible side effects. We think that with the dust in the lungs, if we're attacking primarily pulmonary at first, um, it could make it more effective where you're putting in upwards of between 100 and 500 times less drugs into the system compared to an oral tablet. Um, and the gap closes a little bit with an IV, um, but still, because it's right there and because it's being consumed by the macrophages, the dose should go down quite a bit, which means that the side effects go down quite a bit. Um, and so again, just a quick review. We just made some suggestions there for formulations, but these are our components, right? There's a number of them. Um, and then we make a bulk, steric acid, solid, you know, break it up into pieces, and then we can grind it into nanoparticles that are 30 to 50 nanometers, right? And this gets inhaled, right? So that might even be in an aerosol because they're small enough to be inside an aerosol, and it'll go right into the lungs. It may not have to be a daily dosage, it might be less. Um, and then the, the variations can be tested. So I'd like to take a second and thank you. Um, again, this is the material that we're working on now, the composition. We're trying different ratios and then different dissolution rates to see how it works out. Thank you very much.